Hi, this is Juby Provido, and you're listening to Contemplating the Rosary, where we talk about how to pray the Holy Rosary even better. In 104 episodes, over four seasons, we will explore a method of how to say the Rosary the way Pope St. John Paul II, Pope Paul VI, and other Rosary advocates recommend, and that's by contemplating the mysteries while we say the Our Father, Hail Mary, and Glory Be. This podcast is based on the book Beyond the Veil, Contemplating the Mysteries of the Holy Rosary, available at Lazada in the Philippines and in print or Kindle on Amazon, wherever you are. Visit KindlingsPress.com for more information and where you can read and download the episode guide. This is episode 11. It's so nice to have you back. Today, we'll begin exploring the luminous mysteries, starting with the baptism of our Lord in the Jordan River. When you think about it, in the Rosary, there was a big jump from our Lord's infancy stories to the Passion. There was this big hole in between. But the Catholic world entered into a milestone in 2002 when Pope St. John Paul II shared with us the luminous mysteries. It allowed us to recall those events that revealed the identity of Jesus, His works, and what He taught. He is the light of the world. In the Old Testament, when God wanted to reveal Himself, who He is, what He wanted, His laws, He did it through prophets like Abraham, Moses, Samuel, Elijah, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. They were his spokespersons. But even if God revealed himself this way to his people, the Israelites kept falling in and out of idolatry. It had to do with kings who married Gentile women. Some kings held fast in their faith, but some kings got influenced by their pagan wives to worship idols. I think one of the things we will easily discover when we read sacred scriptures is that God never forces himself on us. He respects our free will. That just makes sense, right? Because if we were made to love Him, our love should be given freely. Otherwise, it is nothing but slavery. So when Israel fell deeper and deeper into worshiping foreign gods, it's like saying they didn't need or didn't want the God that revealed Himself to them. So God gave them exactly what they wanted. He allowed them to live a life without Him. What happened next? Israel split. The northern part fell into the hands of the Assyrians, while the southern part fell into the hands of the Babylonians. And in both cases, the foreign masters exiled the Israelites into their lands. Under Cyrus, some exiles were allowed to return from Babylon, but later Israel would again fall into the hands of the Romans, who brought with them their pantheon of gods. I can't help imagine God looking down in pity and saying, but that's what you wanted. If Israel didn't want God or what he wanted to tell them, it didn't make sense to have a prophet. So God even stopped sending prophets. What's the use, right, if they weren't going to listen to the prophets anyway? So there was a time in Jewish history to those who kept the faith. There was a time they didn't know any prophet. The last was Malachi, which was about 500 years before their time. It was as if God abandoned them. Now, this is important because the identity of Israel is tied to God, because they are the people of God. But God has not made himself felt for almost half a millennia. With God, Israel has no identity, and maybe many of them question their faith. But as I'm sure some of you caught earlier, there were some who clung to the faith. There were devout Jews, and they hung onto the words of Malachi, who quoted God saying, I am sending you Elijah, the prophet, end quote. They also had this same glimmer of hope when Isaiah said, A voice proclaims in the wilderness, prepare the ways of the Lord, make straight the wastelands a highway for our God. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The winding roads shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth, end quote. For us today, these words might sound so flowery. They might not have much sense for us, but to those who were reading or hearing this during the time of Christ, it was a message. A king is coming. This is because every time a king would visit a place, his visit would be announced, and the people in charge of this visit would make sure that the path the king would take would be as straight and smooth as possible. So mountains being cut and valleys being filled is good imagery. 
Sometimes if a road was winding, road planners would build a new road that makes the journey more direct. When we jump to the New Testament, we find that the Gospel of Luke tells us the Jews were filled with great expectation. This was during the time of John the Baptist. The reason for this great expectation is something that the prophet Daniel said. While he was in exile, he foretold of an everlasting justice in the holy city after 70 weeks of years. If one counts the number of years from the time of Daniel, it would fall around the time when St. John started baptizing in the Jordan River. No wonder they were all excited and hopeful. Finally, a prophet had come after 500 years. The Jews had renewed hope that God had not abandoned them after all. With that as a background, I know, I know, I know it was a long background. Let's now look at Christ who presents himself as the new Adam. The baptism that John was performing was not the same as the baptism Christ commanded his disciples to perform later on. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, while the one of Christ's was a baptism of forgiveness. We can trace this to Old Testament times. A rite of repentance wasn't new during John's time because there was a formula for confession in the book of Leviticus that was meant for sinners to leave their sinfulness behind. This confession isn't like our sacrament of confession today where one is forgiven of sins. The one in the Old Testament was one where a sinner promises to live a virtuous life. This was the baptism of repentance John was performing and people went to him in droves. When our Lord approached John, John recognized that Jesus was this person whose way he was preparing. Now, this isn't new. He recognized the unborn Jesus in Mary's womb, even while he himself was still in Elizabeth's womb. So, it isn't surprising he would do it again. Can we imagine him wanting to leap and do a whirly dance the way he did in his mother's womb? John didn't feel he should baptize our Lord because he was the one preparing the way. But Jesus insisted, and John knew his place. John knew his place as the one who would prepare the path for the Lord, so he felt he shouldn't baptize our Lord, but the other way around. But Jesus insisted. And I'm sure you might be asking, why would Jesus want to be baptized in a rite of repentance when he didn't have anything to repent for? We believe Jesus is sinless, so he has no vices. What's there to change? One simple answer is this. Our Lord asked to be baptized to reverse the actions of Adam. If you remember, in the Garden of Eden, after Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, God asked him, Have you eaten from the tree of which I had forbidden you to eat? Adam didn't accept responsibility. In fact, he threw Eve under the bus. He said, The woman whom you put here with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree, so I ate it. Maybe today, it might be paraphrased like this. Lord, if you didn't put that woman with me, I wouldn't have eaten it. So Adam didn't just blame Eve, but he also blamed God for giving him a woman that caused him to sin. From this, we can see that Adam avoided all responsibility. So as Adam represented all humankind in evading guilt, Jesus represents all humanity in his acceptance of guilt. So it is for our benefit that Jesus asked to be baptized. And so John does it. Maybe in this mystery, we can imagine John plunging our Lord under the water of the Jordan River. As our Lord submerges into the water, His holiness sanctifies the water. So that every time someone is baptized today, the waters of baptism have been sanctified by our Lord. And in that way, the water of our baptism carries with it the mark of God. It is marked by God, and when the water touches us, we are marked with God. We belong to Him. And all this because our Lord asked to be baptized by John. Wow, I think that's beautiful. I think we can end this episode here, and let's pick it up again in Seasons 2, 3, and 4. As always, this podcast is brought to you by thecatholictalks.com and kindlingspress.com where you can read more articles on the Catholic faith and find more books on Catholicism. This has been Joby Provido. I'll say goodbye for now, and please join me again next time when we can learn to pray the rosary better. Bye-bye.